that's a kind of an unusual setup for our, our bonus podcast. Usually we're in, in Vilnius discussing basketball stuff, EuroLeague stuff uh, with my guys, Ritis and Augustus. This time we have some solid lineup with Donatos Matunas and Mike James. Hello, guys. What's up? What's going on, man? The, the best thing is that you're not just good, decent basketball players, but also basketball geeks. One is just watching random second division Lithuanian games. <laughs> Mike is taking a New Year break for a trip to Athens to watch... Greek derby, then goes to Spanulis practice. So these guys, they really love basketball. Do you agree with Luca? Uh, probably you heard what he said, that he watches more Euroleague games than NBA games. What, what would you say as a former NBA player? Do you also prefer watching Euroleague games than NBA games? Well, I watch it more just because most of the time, the time difference is, is impossible, but I like it more anyway. You really yeah. mean? Yeah, 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 I like it more most of the time. Unless I'm watching one of my friends, I don't care. Yeah, honestly, for me, I, th I think uh, Euroleague is more interesting. Like uh, during even during the season in China, I didn't really watch NBA when I when I was with Ty Lawson. He was all all the time on his iPad watching the NBA games, different games. I don't feel uh, that interested into the regular season NBA games because you know just overall. It's different, different basketball over there, you know. Um, if there's good teams, two good teams with the good coaches, good players meet up, match up, like it's that sort of match up, that's, that might be something I would watch. But other than that, like Euroleague games are like always intense. Even, uh, you know, looking at overall this year's, um, all the games that you play, you know, first team can play the last team and the last team can win. So it's, it's really, it's really, I feel like it's, it's, it's very competitive and very interesting. If you, if you have a day off, which two teams you love to watch the most? Because you, you're, usually we have those these games clashing each other. That's the problem with the EuroLeague. So if you have to choose two teams playing against each other, which game you turn on on TV? I'll go easy. Zalgiris, that's for sure. That's what I expected. Then, yeah, yeah, but who are they playing? Yeah, Barcelona, probably. Okay. Because of Sharas? Yeah, Sharas, Jokobaitis. Um, you know, I, I like to watch, uh, you know, the way they Mike play. is definitely not watching Barcelona. Not Barcelona. watching that game. <laughs> <laughs> that game not getting watched by me. <laughs> I don't know who I would watch, who I would just pick to watch. Now you pick. You just like the good matchups, I guess. Yeah, like, I just uh, be watching. I don't know. But that wouldn't be like the, my dream matchup. That wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> no. You, you like matchups between teams or between players? Both. I think... Uh, if I know two two teams got like the same position, I'll watch it. Like I don't know, especially like uh, like people who are kind of like still trying to go like getting more responsibility and being more part of a team. Like uh, like for example, even though it's out gears, I would have watched like Keenan versus Chris Jones. I would have watched that. I would have watched that just to see how they play against each other. Yeah, just because they got more responsibility now and just to see how they go against each other. I watch stuff like that. Yeah, um, maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> my, my actually my favorite matchup was Olympiakos and Monaco since the playoffs you had, because there are great matchups. Actually, those teams right now they have two solid players in the uh, MVP race. Also, the rivalry. I believe that it's it's something special. Mike against Laranzakis. Before it was Bacon and Papa Nicolaou. Always something. You against Mustafa Fall. Of course, those games usually are better in Piraeus. Uh, more hostile crowd, better atmosphere, but this is, I think that this is now one of the most uh, fascinating things to watch in the EuroLeague, really. I think they try to escalate that too, you know, <laughs> what I see, you know, even our our media, you know, they try to escalate to make a, like a type of new rivalry. And but I, think I think that that's what creates and brings more attention, just like they did in, in the NBA with Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. That's yeah. how you build the project, uh, product, probably. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. But both teams got to be good, though. The, it worked between Magic Johnson and Larry Bird because they were both sure. good. The best, yeah, the, the best teams, too. So. Both teams got to be good. And it, I guess it helps that we're both playing well. This yeah. Time. Yeah, we're right there, you know. We're going to fight for those spots. It seems the, the, the race is very tight, so it's going to be an interesting season. I would, I would tell you that second half of the season. Mm -hmm. Every game matters, as we say. We'll discuss a lot of different topics uh, from... Panathinaikos stuff since Mike was there uh, recently, Jalgiris, uh, Faku, Free Faku, some other things that are uh, always an ongoing discussion here in Europe. But let's start from Mike's trip to Athens. And let's begin with your 
uh, meeting with Vasilis Ponolis. You met him in practice. Just tell us in the beginning, what's the relationship between you? Because you played for Pau, he was the icon of Olympiakos. I never, you know, saw anything like a big connection be between you guys. Maybe you had something off the floor or how, how to explain that? I mean, yeah, we always, uh, obviously it's a mutual respect just between basketball players, but then uh, I think uh, we always like, um, I wouldn't say similar games, but like similar mentalities, like how we go about things and just uh, how we look at the game. He's a basketball geek, kind of like me. So, you know, uh, I've talked to him a lot just outside of basketball and just picked his brain and just asked him questions and we've had conversations and, you know, uh, relationships are normally formed through, you know, mutual things that you like and, you know, we just kind of grew that way. He's machine. I, I was talking with some better stereo people and they said that at one or two at night, he can text any of his assist assistants to ask, what do you think about this play, about that play, how we should approach this situation. So he's a machine. Yeah, and when I, I got there, he asked me how to guard because uh, they were going to play uh, Holston in them. What's the team? Ritas? No, Holston. Holston? Uh, the team in front. The team in front. Uh, the and Dijon. 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 They were about to play Dijon, and he asked me what I think and like who, how we should guard this. So I was like, "Hey, Billy, I'm not a coach, man. <laughs> I don't got it for you. But what I would do, but don't you know? Don't put yeah, it. Yeah. Don't put it on me if don't it don't work. For real, for the for the war, yeah. Were you asking for some post career tips? Nah, not yet. I'm, I'm getting close, though. I should have asked. Yeah, I I'm getting closer than I, I care to admit. But, uh, you know, he just, uh, you know, he's just, he's actually just a cool guy. Wish me luck. Told me to stop passing. But I'm, I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> that's just, he was like, just be aggressive all the time. Huh? What about Panathinaikos game? Of course, it was not as pleasant to watch uh, as the Serbian derby, which was amazing. I mean, Partizan and uh, Red Star. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, there was no competition out there. Yeah, Pena just looks, looked in that game in just disarray on defensively, honestly. They just looked like they weren't connected. Looked like they didn't have no game plan. Looked like they didn't know have an answer for what Olympiacos was doing, which really wasn't that complicated. They were basically running the same play mm -hmm. the whole time and doing the same thing, but yeah, I think uh, obviously Olympiacos always plays well as a team and shares the ball, so they had a clear plan and it, it just overwhelmed Panna, really. So you just think that it was one bad game or or you just don't like the current state of the club? Um, I don't, I'm not that tuned in enough to just talk about the current state, but uh, I think one bad game is more like you miss shots or like... Uh, you, you get out hustled or something, something that's like fixable, like with effort or, you know, just making some shots or sharing the ball a little bit more, like something that's just kind of easy to tweak. I think they just kind of didn't have a defensive plan, which is strange because I know their coach is kind of like a defensive mm -hmm. guy. So they just didn't look coordinated defensively. They didn't really know what coverages they were running. I didn't see the same coverages every every time. I seen a different person trying to help every time or not helping. I just, yeah, it, it didn't look good. Yeah, after that game, uh, the owner of the team, Giannakopoulos, told the head coach, Radonjic, that you have the unlimited budget. You can improve the team as you want. So if you were GMs, Mike could, could be a GM in the future, probably. You had an eye on Keenan Evans. Uh, if you were a GMs, uh, What's two acquisitions you would do? I mean, it's not necessary to mention a player, the name of the player, but maybe you see some positions where you would look for some improvement. You're talking about their team? Yeah, Pan uh, I can tell you one thing. I think I already told in one of the interviews, uh, Olympiakos, you know, they build up the team the right way and Pan tried to buy it. So, uh, you know, I don't see really that happening that any two players right now just flip the the team completely to from where they at to where they want to be. I said it, uh, you know, Olympiacos took like three, four years to build it up to the team they have and the connection is way stronger than than Panathinaikos, you know, which they throw, a, they brought great players. But now how to connect them, you know, I don't, I don't think they have enough uh, pieces that would connect all those players together in one group. And so, I mean, uh, right now in the market, I don't think there is a player that they can literally just pick it up and be like, hey, this guy's going to save our season or our team. You know, there was a good stretch of a games uh, coming back to the topic that you had 
there was a great stretch of the games that I played uh, when Bacon arrived. But now, last two, three games, uh, I think uh, yesterday, two days ago, they played local league. They won by two points, barely. And, uh, you know, a couple of losses in the EuroLeague already showing that, you know, again, the things are going backwards. So I don't think there is two players that you can pick and be like, hey, these guys are going to flip the things around in, uh, in, in, in Panathinaikos. And this chemistry thing, I mean, Olympiakos chemistry thing, that's what actually one also big EuroLeague player told me, that it's not like they're doing something special or unique, you know, there's no masterclass behind Olympiakos game. There's just chemistry. They know each other for three, four years. They have guards like Kostas Lukas who puts pieces on the court. Vezenkov, all the other guys, they're just playing their roles almost close to perfection. And that's why they're so tough to beat, probably. So I had a similar situation with the Houston, you know, like uh, my rookie year, uh, we were playing Golden State and they couldn't do nothing against us, you know. And then the next year, it seemed we improved as a team and there was just something clicked in that team. And again, they were not running nothing special, you know, same thing, staggers continuously, diamond and stuff like that. And on the end, still Steph would get his open shot, Clay would get his open shot. And, you know, from beating them our rookie year 4-0 in the regular season, we're coming to the next year where we cannot beat them. We just couldn't beat them. Like they were that much better, you know, and like you said, the chemistry clicked and it was, it was, it was awful. I don't know, uh, Mike and I would have also different experience through the chemistry part. Yeah, I think, I think Panna got a few problems, honestly. I think they too predictable on offense. And being that predictable on offense just kind of gives you, predictable in a way where it doesn't like involve everybody. It's basically just, here you go, bake, figure it out. And I'm biased and I know I'm biased, but play Andrew, please play Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, please. They Probably need somebody. They need somebody to create something that ain't got nothing to do with ISO. Like when Nate plays good, they play good. But he can't be the only other option to create something and come off a pick and roll and make a read. Bake can't just do it ISO all game. That doesn't make no sense. He'd even do that for us all game. We pick spots for him to be aggressive and to figure it out, and then we pick spots where we share the ball. So you need somebody else to create something, not just points, but. Draw some fouls, a tag down, down, find a big on the roll, kickouts, and they sign the person to do that, but then they just put him to the side. And I don't, I don't, I, I don't think like Ponika is not really like a creator. He's more like a, just a solid a like glue guy. Yeah, glue guy. Grigonis is more of a shooter, and you know, everybody has roles on the team, but I feel like the person they missing is the person they just stop playing. Do you know why they shut him down so early? I mean, Anders. Oh. They were already lacking of, you know, men on their rotation before signing Bacon and before some, some other players were injured as well. So yeah, it was I weird. I don't, I don't understand, but I think... Uh, there probably are some things that we don't know behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not privy to speak about. Yeah, because now there are rumors that something like that can happen to Maris Grigonis, for example. So that, that's weird. That's weird what's happening in that organization. It's, uh, th that's what I wanted to say. It's, it's a weird situation. But again, you know, just looking at the past past years uh, in Panathinaikos, what was going on over there, you know, it's, uh, it's not a surprise that certain, uh, that type of rumors are going around. Yeah, they that. just have to find some identity. I mean, I think Olympiakos had not the same problem, but they had a problem For in, in the last Spanulis years. I think that he just retired a little bit too late, one or yeah. two seasons. Um, and he should, and you know, he kind of put the team in a tough situation. They still have to rely on him a lot because he's that kind of player, but they cannot to start their own something something new. Yeah, before last year, they weren't that good for like three, four years. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. So they build it up. And honestly, like talking about Spanulis, on the end, uh, I, I can compare him with like, for example, Dirk, you know, also last one, two years for Dirk was like, that they were just giving those years for him to retire and that they can rebuild, you know, like everyone knew like what he achieved for, for Dallas uh, championship, you know, amazing, pl playing amazing and stuff like this. And I felt like um, for Spanulis, they did the same thing. You know, I think he deserved to finish on a high note and whatever he decides, like he already had that status as a, as a, as a EuroLeague player. That's why Mike doesn't want to finish the career that late, right? I remember yeah. you saying something that no, you I have to, be, I can't two be years in your tank, you right? Whenever I feel like I'm going to be weak, I'm going to just stop. <laughs> Even if it's mid-season, if I'm just like, yeah, this ain't it. I'm done. I'm going home. 
What, the, what about the evergreens? Žalgiris, first of all. Oh, that's my team. We can talk about it all day, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Žalgiris so, podcast. He sits next to me in the locker room, oh, too. He's always bringing yeah. this shit up. I mean, honestly, wait, you, you, were, you were the one who said it, um, that you were very close to sign with Žalgiris. Yeah, yeah, one year. before Basconia. Yeah. Yeah. Before Basconia. Before Basconia. Yeah. Before your rookie year league season, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you probably didn't they that. didn't sign you. They offered me, but they just offered me like two days after Basconia. Oh, you okay. see? You know, it wasn't. And I had already said I was going to sign with Basconia. Mm, yeah. And I didn't want to be like the guy who said I was going to do this and then sign somewhere else. So. I've just, I've and just. It was around the same money, so it was just like, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay. I've just watched Luis Figo. I don't know if you, if you guys yeah. watched the documentary. He kind of switched though. teams like five times before making the final statement. That's crazy considering his status that he had in, in, in football. But wow, I didn't know that. That's, that's interesting. Although I think that, you know, I think you made the right move because Basconia has history of being a great platform for all these guards. Shea Larkin, you, uh, it was Darius Adams. Right. Me, also yeah. played there, Rodrigo Bobois. I mean, now Marcus Howard, Darius Thompson. Yeah. What, what's so special about about them? Is it just good think, scouting by? I think yeah, they Salazar? just got a good scout. I think they. Uh, I think they're also always actively looking too, because they got me like in the middle, like towards the beginning, middle season. I came in like December, I think, like right before top sixteen started. So, mm. I think they're always actively looking, always trying to make moves, and I think. Uh, At the time, her tail was going to Ephes in the middle of the season. Mm. So I think they were just trying to bring in some new guards just to figure it out. And so me and Darius came in like two weeks apart. So Dima, what do you think about Polonara and Taylor? I think it's uh, amazing pickups. Looking at okay. the stage of the season, looking at overall the situation, you know, there was a lot of rumors about Polonara going to Zvezda. And, um, you know, just looking at... Uh, I mean, I love Tyler, but he was not playing up to the, his potential this year for this season. I think they, they need someone more consistent shooter. And I think Paul Nara is that guy. Um, you know, with the Isaiah, we'll see if, if he can, he can bring her up. But from, from what I know, from what I've, I have seen, I mean, he's electric, energetic player. And uh, I think he's gonna, he's gonna do great also. I think he, he was waiting for this opportunity to play in, um, in the Euroleague to get this chance. And I think Jalgris is a perfect spot for him again to show himself and to show what kind of player he is. I have no doubts about Pol Polonara, but I'm just a little bit curious about Taylor because, because he he's different than Keenan Evans. Yeah, but he played only in ACB, uh, you know, and also that's very hard to, to discuss, you know. Mm. Um, he didn't play bad in FS though when he was there. No, 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 no but it's, it's not like saying. that he was bad, but I just think that Keenan Evans was just better with this ability to score those contested beyond the arc shots. I just think that Taylor loves to penetrate more. Yes, and I, do, I I'm afraid that we have too many guys who loves to play inside the paint, for example. What if they will close? But, we'll see. I mean, there is uh, also, you can spread the floor with the Schmitz, you know, and Sim Polonara, if you put uh, shooting shooting five and put Isaiah in the middle and make him to attack, mm. then what are you going to do, you know? There's different options. I think the key for use our gears fans is not to expect Isaiah Taylor to be as good yeah, as Keenan. Yeah. No, for sure, for sure. Let him be him. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean he was he was playing amazing, you know, even and even what, here what he could position are they in now? Ninth, eighth, seventh, I think eight, like eighth, eighth, ninth, ninth. In the mix from yeah. like yeah. eighth to twelfth, something like that. So yeah, I mean they're still fighting. You'll have home crowds, so You have opportunities. If you take all the home games which they're doing, you know, I don't think I think they lost only two FS at home. So if, if they continue to do that, winning at home and, you know, grabbing one on the road victory here and there, I think they're right there in the mix where they need to be. Mm, yeah, I think they already overachieved. So we just have to enjoy them every time being competitive and being close even in the game against you. It was it was a great game. They actually, the game slipped away from, from their hands. So you yeah, were right kind of lucky in that, on that night. They were they, they were playing way better than us. I'm not gonna lie, you know. <laughs> like uh, I'll be honest, I, I was like, watching. <laughs> so <laughs> fast, so fast. Uh, yeah, I mean, we didn't play to our potential. That's for sure. That game, you know. But on the end, uh, the season is long, so some that type of wins are still a win, you know, in the in the table on the table. So you have to take it. Maybe it's not the previous one, but you know, we definitely need it. Mike, you were a fan of Keenan Evans, right? Do you think he was irreplaceable in this in this market? 
Now, in the yeah. middle of the season? Yeah, yeah. I don't think for sure. I don't think so. I think he's probably a top 10 point guard in your league. Yeah. B- before the injury, what were you thinking about his future? Do you have any comparisons? Um, He was probably going to go somewhere. I mean, to be honest, he probably had action. I mean, if everybody in your league needs a, a, a good point guard to lead their team. So, I mean, it's not a lot of us like elite point guards there. And I think he had potential to be one of them. The way he was playing, especially from the last year to this year, that's a big growth. So I think uh, I was excited about seeing what he, how he was going to finish the season and where he, what's going to happen mm-hmm. next year. But I think uh, he seemed like he worked hard, so he should be back, hopefully. Uh, he will be back, definitely. You know, I actually heard that there was some rumors about a defender being interested in him for next year, which, you know, that would be that's a huge thing. payday, yeah. But then, like, you know, as a Jalgiris fan, you know, I expect that he's going to come back and he's yeah. going to prove his he worth next year. Season. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not like he's without a contract or he's in a big trouble, you know, I think. Uh, yeah, I and think, I think how good he played, you guys got you guys got to at least keep him, even though he got hurt. No, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's, that, that's for sure what's going to happen. I'm not, I'm not even worried about that. I think, uh, I think also the doctors in Lithuania did a great job. I know the person that uh, made a surgery on him and he's one of the best, so. How usual it is, like, I remember he got injured at the first minute of the game. So it, it means like it was one past eight. I remember we finished the game. I just talking with some guys in the tunnel and I'm receiving the message that, oh, he was already operated. And it was like around 11 o'clock. So in three hours, he got injured. He went to the locker room, then to the hospital. He got the best doctor in Lithuania and, you know, the surgery was completed. Maybe even in Europe, one of the best that specialist, uh, you know, also good with, with yeah. us very well. Um, I mean, honestly, with this type of injury, from what I know, uh, the the time is very important. Sooner you get it fixed, the uh, higher rate of recovery there is. So that means like faster they, they operate, with, especially this injury. That means that uh, he might be recovering like fully without any any problems. Happy for him. I hope, I hope it goes well. Seriously. Yeah. No, I know. I, I know. seen the yeah, video. Yeah. I seen the video. I was. Scared. I know. We were. We were like actually. Uh, we were about to. We just arrived to the to the to the arena. Yeah. In in Belgrade, and I saw the news, and I was like, man, like, I hope they're not gonna lose. Like you know, because again, I'm supporting them, and then they they won that game. That it's, was it's crazy nice, game. But, yeah. That was crazy game. Everyone was. Uh, everyone was talking about it. Like I couldn't watch it, but I heard it was it was it was a very nice effort. Now everyone is talking about the our point guard, Falco Campazzo, who still cannot uh, play for Zvezda in the EuroLeague. What do you think about that situation in general? Mike, you can start. It's a weird situation. It's not a weird situation for I me. Think, like, I, I, I will tell my opinion. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let, allow Mike tell his. I think I want him to play first yeah. before I say anything else. I do want him to play. We all want probably, yeah. But I mean, I don't know the rules. And if they're not paying people, like, even though he's getting punished, kind of, they're, he's on their team, so it's really it could have been anybody. So anybody that would have signed there, they would have had the same problem. So it's not just against Faku. So, and I love Faku; that's my guy. But I mean, if you're not paying players, we have something, some type of fairness or some type of rules had to be installed for you to like have some type of punishment if you're not paying people. Like everybody, nobody should go to work and not get paid. So if they're not getting, if some you're not paying people, like. I think it's it should just, okay now you you played a lot of seasons in Europe so you kind of got used to our no, how it's normal for us to not to get paid at least in basketball teams yeah, for three four be. months and everyone is like okay it's just Europe it's just European thing because coming off stays there there's nothing like that probably you know no. late payments or stuff. If you're supposed to get paid on the first and the first on the Sunday they'll send it on Friday. Friday right yeah. two days before yeah, yeah. you're getting paid two days early. I think actually kind of the same it's like in Germany or probably yeah. in France as yeah, well yeah, they yeah, have yeah. they have these strict rules but these are coming from governments, governments I believe yeah. so that's what you know keeps the control of these payments i think not getting paid on time is like that's the bare minimum like if like players coming to practice 15 minutes before practice at least that's like the bare minimum yeah like that's the least you could do to be on a team to be an organization and then i hit when these players they're not paid for like a few months the coaches the managers they're saying oh you're not you know leaving your heart on the court oh you're not focused or oh, your lack of concentration or something that's bullshit i mean well this is what you know 
That's what it's actually, not about Zvezda, but exactly. it's just in general about European no, in general, basketball the, problems. The, yeah, this is what we're talking about. This was for years and now we have a strong backup. We have a union that each of us paying money for to protect our rights. And, you know, and talking about this situation, I had a clear, clear answer for you. You know, they're not paying players. This is the situation. Even Campazzo, you know, he's the victim in this situation. But like Mike said, any other player could be in that situation. But now we're talking about all the league players over one guy. I mean, we have to be protected for these situations not appear. They had a time to fix this problem and they didn't. So it's not a player association. It's not EuroLeague's problem. It's the team. The team is not taking care of their own side. And, you know, this is the punishment they get. But what if they paid all the debts? Okay, so pay all the debts. I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is the rules. Like, uh, they pay all the debts. The EuroLeague uh, allowed them oh. to register players. That's so how the ban it was, was extended for two months. Well, that months. means that they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't make the the payments, you know. And okay, those players are wearing uh, t-shirts and everything. I think it's it's, it's fake, you know, because the same players they're not getting paid for for that. I feel that, like I said, I understand, and I feel Campazzo, it's it's best situation for him. But then we're talking about again, like his teammates are not getting paid, and then hmm. you know you, you want to sign this guy. So what? You're not going to get paid for half a year right now, or what's going to be the situation after? Yeah, I don't know who's not getting paid or none of that. But I, I am saying, if they're not paying players or have debts, they need to take care of that before. Before yeah, before making signing, scandal before or trying, yeah, yeah, we're trying to make it seem like like mm -hmm. there's a leak problem or, or or cessation problem. No, it's not. Everything was working till this point perfectly. There was uh, no late payments. If there's a late payments, they're getting banned to sign the new players. That was the rules. They knew the rules before the season. They knew the rules last year. They knew the rules before that. And Somehow, that means, just now, it appeared. That means somebody had to say something about not getting paid for exactly. It. So somebody's mad about it. Yeah, mm. and I think that even the bigger problem problem was that they hide some things. Probably exactly. they hide some some payments, some some overdue payments they didn't cover. Oh, yeah. Didn't they say like they did pay it and they didn't really? Ain't that what they got? I don't really know what they got in trouble for. But I don't know. Too, right but, now, but I think that all saying. the players were fully paid. I mean, even from the previous seasons, I. From what I've heard, the problem was that, okay, at first, they, some of them weren't paid, but the, probably the bigger problem was that before the season, when the season started, Zvezda declared that they have no debts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's at least that's what's coming from, from sources. So maybe that was the problem for you, like that, A, you're lying to us. We're trying to set some rules, some financial framework, and you're just entering the season like this. Well, exactly. So maybe that's a, you know, a, that's a bad example for the rest of the EuroLeague, and especially when, when you're not a, a shareholder of the EuroLeague. Yeah, well, you know, there's rules we have to obey. Like, like us players, we, we have to follow the rules. Like Mai said, like, there's a bare minimum. We have to be here before 15, 20 minutes before practice. They have to pay on time, you know. Season's finished, you have to get paid, all the money. From my side, this is, everything is logical. The station is not nice. I, like I said, I feel the player. But it's, it's, it's a club's problem, not, uh, not Campazzo's. Like, but what was the inner discussion between ELPA members? Because uh, ELPA, they released a statement I supporting the player. They either. wanted them to play. So that, that was also interesting. I haven't talked to nobody at all. So uh, they didn't uh, ask my opinion. Yeah, honestly, I didn't talk to. I just read the statement that, uh, you know, they're supporting him playing and everything. But in the same statement, they said that there are rules and the rules have to be followed. Simple as that. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. You know, that's that's what I'm saying. Like me, him, all of us, we're, we're putting our money on the table for ELPA to make sure that our money is on time, that there was no problems behind that and stuff like that. So this is this is what we're paying for, you know, to have our money on time to, you know, you do the job, you get paid. Everywhere else works it's, like that. It's so crazy that we have to deal with all these problems in Europe. Yeah, we had some it, teams in our tournaments with like 18, 19, 20 bands from, from, from FIBA and they're still competing in competitions and nothing like happened. Yeah, so it used to be like that. I just don't But finally, it. finally, like I said, it seems like just talking about this is the first situation in, in the last couple of years. It seemed, it seemed like we're going the right direction as a, as, as a, as a, as a basketball, you know. Yeah, I think Kimke, they had this band two years ago, but it was like that they, are, they were already in shit. So there was no chance for them to sign two million players like, like Red Star did with uh, Composite. Right I don't understand that. How are you like Red Stars, you know, I like having them in the league. It's nice. Yeah. They got great Good fans, fans yeah. all that. Yeah. That's true. But how do you like go from a team that couldn't sign no big players and then you sign Vidoza, Compato, spend all this money in the middle of the season? 
and then you're not paying people. I just, I'm just, I'm just confused on where the yeah. money come from, how we're doing this, how you can do that and not pay other people. Like, I don't yeah, understand. A, mm. There's a lot of in, interesting things going on. Yeah, I can yeah I'm tell confused. You that. Like, but yeah. I mean, mm. you know, it's not really none of my business. So, but yeah. you should pay pay the players. That's just yeah. Bottom line, pay people that work for you. Yeah. Tonight, Olympiakos is playing Monaco, and two potential MVPs are facing each other. Not kind of literally facing each other, you're playing different positions, but Mike James, Sasha Vizenkov, they're mentioned in this MVP ladder. But just talking in general about the Euroleague, Euroleague MVPs mostly, there was this big conversation last year already. How would you describe the MVP? Who is the MVP? This is probably the never-ending topic, both in the Euroleague and even more in the NBA. Yeah. You want me to talk? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be biased. No, go, go ahead, man. Uh, uh, I think the MVP to me is like the person who, like, I wouldn't say does the most with least, but like, if you get your team to somewhere they're not supposed to be at, and you guys are having a better season than anybody ever thought you would have, and you led them to that, I think you should be in MVP consideration. Like... You're the main guy on the team. Everybody knows it. You helped your team get there. And that's how you win MVP. I think the best player on the best team shouldn't, to me, isn't always MVP. I feel like mm. you could, you know, no disrespect to nobody. I'm not taking shots at anybody. Yeah. No. But you, I, I don't have a problem with them winning MVP. But that's just not my, how I would describe it. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, I think it should be more, um, I mean, I think there is already a scoring title. Is, is there a new release yeah, scoring, scoring title? title? Alfonso Ford scoring title, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, like scoring title, then MVP, you know, just looking overall, like um, regular season is a different story than a playoffs. And to describe like one guy like, you know, Miritich, okay, he was very influential last year, playing amazing season. But they didn't win the championship, you know, and I don't know, like it, 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 it feels... I think they should just exclude, I mean, regular season MVP and the finals or, I don't know, the playoffs also is not fair enough because you play the playoff series and then, then there are just two games. So it's it's tough. It takes away, uh, actually, it adds up like um, spiciness, I would say, to, 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 the, to the game, but then it takes away the all, you know, you can do great for a whole year and then something goes wrong in a, in that couple of weeks period where we have to prepare and get ready for those two most important games and your team is not winning, you know. I think your league is kind of chicken sometimes. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to give out MVP to somebody who don't go to Final Four. But sometimes uh-huh. you cannot go to Final Four and be MVP this season. I've yeah. seen it plenty of times. No, that's what that, he said. Where the best yeah, player yeah. is just, he just didn't, his team just didn't make it. But mm-hmm. we all know who was the best player the whole season. We all know who brought their team. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I feel like they wait until after the playoffs to say, okay, this person made Final Four, we can give him MVP, and we won't get any, like, shame for it. I think they should also involve uh, players for, for, for voting, and I don't know if they do. They don't. They we don't. Ever, we, we, they voted last year at the Elpo one, remember? The Elpo one, yeah. 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 But this one I'm saying, the yearly one is not. Like, I think they should also include, include players since, you know, we're part of a game. I think this is the most uh, honest opinion you will get. Because you face media vote for it? Who votes for MVP? Media? GMs and media? There's you know? like media, there are, they split the percentages. I know media ain't voting for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hey, I doubt it. I doubt it. I need to see the voting, man. <laughs> That's how they do in the NBA, I think. They yeah. publish the voting process. Yeah. So that would be nice. They should do players. Players should get like 10 or yeah, that that one year, uh, James Harden was uh, was not named MVP. It was like ridiculous, you know. And they announced it, and media was against him bad. Like you know, when mm-hmm. they announced the. That's what I'm saying. No, I mean, I yeah. never win MVP with that. What if media is in it and GMs? We need to do just players. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe coaches. I'll be solid with coaches. <laughs> but okay, we can all agree that the best player of the team, which overachieved makes him a clear MVP uh, contender. But what if there are no uh, overachievers? For example, this season is, is one of uh, one of the kind. With many teams on the top with 11, 12 uh, wins, the same winning record. What should we do then? I think Mike made a really good point. You know, the, 
there are players who make such a big influence for a, for a team, for a, for, for a basketball team that, uh, you know, without him, for example, the team wouldn't be there. So those players should be the ones that actually people should be, put attention to it, you know, like when, you, when you're voting for the MVP. Like, I don't, I don't want to say nothing, but like Mike is, is a huge influence for our team. You know, like most of the things are going through him. He's he, he's the one who's actually changing game, deciding uh, the, the game. So, you know, players like this, they should supposed to be like in the, in the tie race like this uh, for the playoffs and for everything. Players like like that should be the ones who should be considered as, as, as MVP. But it's actually so hard to win the MVP for a big man because if I remember well, Jan Veselik, who actually played also as a power forward under yeah. Obradovic, he's the only one big guy or let's say closest to the real center who won the MVP since 2004 and, or 5. Yeah, I think I was second in that vote too. Okay. I mean, basketball Ooh, changing I'm just Europe. always second, man. It's just bad. <laughs> it's bad voting. Media, man. Media. Media is killing me out here. <laughs> What what the big man should do to become the MVP? I mean, uh, it's, it's not about big man. I think um, there's a lot of great big men this year that uh, came from the NBA, uh, came from the you know Euro Cup, Champions League. Then um, they made a huge impact on their teams. You know, uh, talking about uh, Lesort, Motley. You know, those guys they came in with a huge energy. They're showing incredible potential. But again, the basketball has been played a little bit different in, in these days, and uh, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's fashionable to to play through the big guys as it used to be, you know. And so, because of that, uh, I think the the influence from uh, I wouldn't say influence the the tension is, is moved away from the big guys towards the, the towards the small guys who can create, who can do many more things. Yeah, I think it's tough for bigs to win. <laughs> yeah. I think it's tough. You don't get a lot the of last team, right The here. last team I seen play through the big was when I was on basketball. Yeah, we played through the Bruces. Uh, but he shot threes too, though, and he yeah. passed. Yeah. That's right. It's, um, I, to be honest, I, he could have won MVP that year. He could He could have. They I mean, he it was the first team, I think, yeah. right? That, and we went to the Final Four, and we had to be a surprise. He actually should have won it, now that I'm th rethinking about it. Uh, they might have cheated him out of the MVP. <laughs> I need to look who won it that year. Yeah, I remember Nikola Vucic should have been probably even he he might have been the MVP or no no probably not but I mean he had a huge influence on yes, the game. Yes, uh, Maccabi like this. He was like saying, Nikola so. Jokic of, of yes. the year league back in the day. So I remember. Yeah, I think it's tough for bigs to win MVP now. They don't get the ball enough. True. It's, it's okay as long as we're winning, we're happy. <laughs> so, we're we're the team they players, man. It's not it's not enough. Check, so we're good. And it's just yeah, they don't get the ball enough. It's different, different basketball, like I said. It's okay. I mean, Mirtich is a big kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. in some sense. Yeah. People so also, yeah, that, that's exactly. People also love rank players by some stats. What do you think was the most un uh, overrated stat in today's year league basketball, especially? What do you think about player index rating? Overrated stat? I think that might be a little overrated. Yeah. Because I feel like, it's based on just shots, like just if you make shots. But I feel like some people just have to take tougher shots, so you're going to have lower percentage, so your PIR going to be lower. Overall, I think the stats don't show as much influence as you can see. We should have an open shot creator. How many open shots they created? I want to see my stat on that. Mm -hmm. So this Good is the point. thing, like NBA is all about the stats, you know, and, and this is the thing behind the stats. You rarely can see, uh, you know, real influence of a player, you know. Uh, there is no stat how many times you dive on the floor or five foot a ball. Like a 50 50 yeah. ball. Or yeah, like 50 a screen 50 ball. Assist. Yeah. Like how many stats you hear about, like, oh. Now we have screen assists, I think. I think I, I'm, I'd be high in guards. Yeah. In guards, oh, yeah. probably. You're getting on yeah. me all the time. <laughs> in guards, I'd be high on my screen assists on guards. No, for sure. For sure. But yeah, like, um, like I said, there's a lot of things overlooked, and, and I, th I think it's not very, very easy to. To say hey, this stat isn't the only one that really matters. I mean, PIR is cool though. Yeah, it's a it's a cool stat, but I think like you shouldn't determine your whole somebody's whole season off of PIR. Like, For sure, they they have something like that in they be like a per. But nobody takes it serious. I think. I mean, I never heard that somebody about compared it. them or ranked them. It's it, only like if like Giannis has like the best per ever they be like and he got the best per ever he needs to win yeah, MVP yeah, it's, it's, like, it's, it's just an <laughs> argument to yeah. use for somebody it's not really like a 
like, oh, he has this, so he got to have this. You know what I'm saying? It's just like an argument to use. It's not yeah. like the end all be all like it is in Europe. Guys, tell me what do you think about the number of the year league games, about the current year league format, because it feels like only head coaches, they're talking about it. And actually, from what I hear, I think that we're on the verge of some, some change. Uh, there was an idea that maybe in January or February, the new year league leadership will present some options, how the competition should evolve, how the format uh, could be changed. What do you think? What improvements we, you players, would like to bring uh, to the table? I mean, me and Mike talked a lot about like the stuff like, they did. I got like yeah. nine ideas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, but the ones we talked, I think, was the you know, overall, like, you know, we tried to make money out of the yearly, how you put eight games at the same time. Mm -hmm. This is something, you know, that even for a, for a kid, understandable. Like, we, we go to Mike's, we went to Mike's house to watch the game, and you have to choose between which game you're going to watch, you know, instead of like the split screen. Yeah, I mean, so I think this is. This they should is do thing. something like in football. They start games at eight o'clock or ten o'clock Lithuanian time. Yeah. That's it. There's a span of two hours, so you can watch more games. Exactly. Or at least an hour. Like at least let me get this game out the way and turn it to into the second half. Like at least an hour. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's where they lose a lot of money, you know, and that's where they have to ch like the marketing in your league got to change. It's a little bit. We need to do a little bit better, yeah, man. I think it's outdated. Yeah. We need to if, if we want to generate some money and and take advantage of. In what ways? It's a lot of ways. There's a lot of things that they could do different. Like, why is there not like a, like how they got NBA on TNT? Why they don't, why we don't have one of them? Yeah, like national televised. Like, something like you that. You could just televise like a preview of who's finna play, where the standings is, who's playing good, who needs to step it up. Take 30 minutes before the beginning of a whole night and then. Then what I said, it was like uh, sell clothing rights. You know, have uh, all the EuroLeague teams wear Adidas or Nike or whatever, you know, and uh, sell those rights. You know, in the beginning, maybe it's not going to be as high as, as, you know, you expect. Like, maybe your team's going to share a little bit of money, players going to share a little bit of money. But look where NBA got there, you know. They actually started also low, but then now it's like, I don't know how much Nike's paying for, for that, but it's, it's crazy money, you know. Like, and this is where the, you start making money by making those type of decisions, you know, start to look where to make money, not to like, okay, whatever, whichever team gets whatever sponsor, we don't care, do whatever. Uh, all-star game. Yeah, all-star game. It needs to be all-star game? It needs to be all-star game. Yeah. A whole, a nice little two-day weekend. Yeah. Do it in Barcelona. Yeah, it's nah, a nice don't city. do it in Barcelona. Do it in Athens or like Serbia or like Lithuania. Somewhere they got crazy fans. Like he Turkey. just dropped Lithuania. He doesn't like Lithuania that much. He just I'm just saying. Every, yeah, just I'm just saying. I was like, what? I'm just saying, man. Do it somewhere where they got a lot of fans and a lot of people to go. It'll be That'll fun be nice. for people to go. Yeah, they should try something like that. I don't think they... They, they can do... It's enough people. A dunk contest would be nice. I'd like to see some of the people in our dunk contest. Yes. Nebo. Tay. No answer. You know what I'm saying? I'd like to see some people go have a dunk contest, like four people. Yeah. Three point contest should Three be point contest awesome. will be all right. I'll go watch, yeah. and then the next day just had a, the game. The actual league make a lot of money out of it. Yeah, I know. A lot of people NBA, go. I'm talking about yeah. NBA. You know, and then so. the city, you can do like sponsored little like uh, seminars like the and final stuff. Four, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. give us a playoff series until the finals and just make this two day event, weekend event for the All Star game, for example. Yeah. It, w it would be, I think, also attractive for fans. I don't see why not to see all these players from different, like, who, who don't want to see Mike with Slukas playing the same team, you know. That's what I'm and saying. Like, so What would be, the, I mean, the idea of teams playing is like West, East or USA, the rest you of the world? You just do, have people vote, do captains. Yeah, exactly. And then, the and then have NBA them pick, mm -hmm. have them pick from like a pool. It would be easy. That wouldn't be that hard. Especially if we go with conferences right now from the following years, that would make a lot of sense. I mean, East, West. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I said, maybe, let's hope maybe it's the steps toward, towards the... It wouldn't be that hard. A lot of people would go, I think. Uh -huh. Especially in, in first years, you know, yeah. that would be something new, exciting. Yeah. With all the biggest names. And even then, they can try to attract more and more fans to it, you know, try to, like even make, maybe in London, for example, where you're really actually trying to expand Mm. To, to try to, you know, I'm take over sure that I'm not sure coming to watch those games. <laughs> really. yeah, it's, I was it's, in the Final Four twice there, it was like half it's empty. Bad, uh, 
It was half empty. Athens would be nice. Athens, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, Greece, uh, Serbia, yeah, Serbia, Mike mentioned all these Cra- people. Cra- Istanbul would be nice. Istanbul, yeah, the, the fans are actually. Arena. Yeah. I'm trying to think about nice arenas. Yeah, too. nice arenas that has a good fan base. People would come. I think. You know. Yeah. Who don't? People want to see certain people play with each other. Just Together, to yeah, exactly. So we're not touching the format. We're all good with 18 teams in the regular season, 34 games. I mean, I'm not intelligent enough to decide how many teams should be where. I would love for it to be closed so, so we don't got to play in the domestic league sometimes. But yeah. besides that, whatever. I think we're very close to the 18 teams. Okay, maybe I would say, like you said, like you said they do the uh, kind of conferences. two conferences. Yeah. Yeah. Probably so to make it 10 to 10. 24. That's what I'm saying, like 20 or 24, that's right there. Then how would you but play then, each other? That's Home away games in the own you know conference they, and then single game with their other conference teams. 33 games, actually. But honestly, by that time, they have to be, like Mike said, the closed league. Mm. Like, you know, that you don't really need to compete in your own championship because if you have 24 teams, how many games are you going to play then? 33. Well, yeah, and then it's plus actually the same. And, like and right then, now, then if you need to play another fifty-three games in a, and we're talking just about regular season, like there was a moment when NBA was uh, eighty-two, and Europe was like fifty. Right now, we're talking about mm-hmm. fifty-three Euroleague games, and then another maybe fifty or forty-eight mm-hmm. local championship, and then with it's a playoffs cups. with two cups, and then championship. Like we're gonna have like twice as long as we're about to play baseball season, goddamn. We played in, <laughs> into June twenty third last year. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like my friend called me. He was like, "Hey, are you still playing?" I said, "Yeah, why?" He's like, "Man, I'm going through the sports channels. I see like athletics, and I was like, Monaco playing. You're like, what day is it?" Like, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, I thought I was leaving after the Olympiaco series. He's like, "All right, we're going back to LA now." I said, "Bro, I got a whole another season to play." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's too many games for you guys as well, right? I don't have a problem with playing EuroLeague games. Like, you get up for that, but it's just like you come. I feel like the domestic league is just like sometimes it's just an extra bother. Like, you got to stay locked in. You got to come. You got to take it serious. And it's just tedious at some point. Like, yeah, it's, not to disrespect nobody. No, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's but maybe, hard. Maybe sometimes we could join in the playoffs or something. Like, put us fourth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or fifth. And let give us play. Yeah, yeah, give us like you we can we don't even don't even give us home court advantage. Just put us fifth and see how we figure it out. Because now to fly, you know, you, you still have to fly everywhere like for us. And then I you know we have a charter, you know, some of these teams I know, even I in the feel, early days fly commercials. Well, that's we another, just played yeah. yesterday and we play tomorrow, we play the next Thursday day and the and next then, day after that it's yeah. like you play when you have a double week it's like you got four games in one week. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, but, you know. Imagine if they all on the road. Yeah. So it's good that, you know, at least it's, it's manageable. But other than that, like, the load is crazy. It's not easy. But in the same time, I think that's another step for, for EuroLeague to make sure that all the teams fly charter, you know. Like, if you do, like, okay. You have to get a sponsorship. Right? But that's what I'm saying. Like, get sponsorship. Like, you know, mm. build it up. There is ways to build it up. And then, you know, you give, uh, every team can, can have a charter you already, then, you know, less complaining about, okay, these guys are over tired or something like this, then you take that away. Right now, like you said, there are some teams that they can afford, like uh, flying charter every time, so. Yeah, I got another idea, but I, I see, I read it on one of the topics, so I'm gonna wait till that come up. <laughs> all right. Since you're coming, uh, since you're playing almost the NBA season, can you compare how hard coaches uh, get on you compared to the NBA and here in Europe? Don't you feel that maybe there's too much pressure uh, from their side on players because they want all the time you to compete at your best? Sometimes they complain that, oh, my players, this and that game, they, they lacked of concentration, of motivation and stuff. I think the problem is in Europe, coaches and players just get removed so fast that it's hard to like say like, yeah, we just lost two games, but it'll be okay. It's hard to have that mentality because if they lose a third game, they could get fired or a player could be moved. I think there's no like certainty in playing over in, in Europe. So people will get a little bit nervous about, you know, their job, their well-being, just being able to stick around, like being on the hot seat, like having pressure, like sometimes people, you know, 
just need to just relax and just <laughs> take take some time and say, you know what, season can't be perfect. We are gonna lose games. Yeah, especially in November, December, or January. Yeah, probably. like sometimes you lose a game you weren't supposed to lose. Sometimes you know things don't go right, and then sometimes you play in Madrid and you hit four point plays. You know, season's crazy. I think it's mostly cultural thing, especially those fans. Mm -hmm. the, the best thing is when teams lose important games and if somebody sees some player at the nightclub, even if he's drinking juice or at the bar or at the restaurant, smiling, that's a tragedy for them because you have to, you have to, you, you know, enjoy your feel life. a big pain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's so hard to, to make fans understand, you know, that we're human beings too, you know, <laughs> like for them, we're ent entertainers and it seems like for them, we have to be like this, 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 you know, and, uh, we also humans, you know, for us to also sometimes you want to go away for a day or two somewhere, you know, to just to get away from the older routine and uh, traveling and then playing, you know, like again, we're talking about almost uh, almost NBA season playing right now, you know, and uh, it's not easy to to be focused for, for that long without, you know, just re hitting a reset button at some point of the season. Did you ever notice? I mean, usually coaches are those who are saying that, oh, players were not you know, motivated for the game, they were not focused. Do you f sometimes feel that the coaching staff was not focused on some particular games? For sure. <laughs> Why, I know I don't want to say that. I'm no, for sure. Way. I mean, it happens from both sides, sides, you know? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I mean, because it happens from now both it feels like, you know, when you hear all these pr press conferences, it's like one, one way, you know, one way road all the time. I mean, I can tell you just f l looking at everything this week, you know, if we play every other game, you know, like Sunday game will be like, okay, you know, maybe a little bit tweaks in the here and there, but it's not going to be like full, full ass practice to prepare ourselves. So, you know, it's just, it's normal. Uh, we have to accept that. And, uh, you know, like we uh, coaches are humans too, you know, they, they get tired, they get uh, tired from the routine. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in their families too. You know, they get a lot of pressure. Like we just talked enormous pressure from the fans, from the management, from everyone. So I think it's normal that, uh, that they feel it. Speaking of coaches, usually when coaches like, if the team had Jelko Bradovic, I don't know, Sergio Scariolo, Ettore Messina, these were, these were like title contending teams. Everybody expects these teams coached by those coaches to be on top. This season was different. We saw Milan uh, on, on the bottom of the standings for a while. Uh, Partizan, they needed their time, you know, to find their way. Uh, Scariolo is still trying to find an identity with Virtus. There are some other teams uh, that are struggling, although they're coached by big time coaches. And okay, maybe it's that part of the game where it's only January, December, and we will we will count chickens as we say in Lithuania in April and June. But maybe it's also because the impact of the, these head coaches is not as big as it was before, where they had like five, six days uh, days to prepare for the game. And just in general, what do you think? Especially my, I mean, you're coming to Europe where it's probably I would say coaches league, coaches continent. It should be way different from from states, right? And looking from from aside, doesn't doesn't does it look like a bit overrated thing? The impact of the head coaches, with all the respect, uh, the current head coach of Monaco or all the other coaches, but just in general, it's I think it's another cultural thing that we're like we think that most of these coaches are gods. Some of them were idols for players, for fans. The way they how they were strict how they control the game, how they shout at others. Fans love to see coaches shouting at players for some reason, at least in Serbia and <laughs> Balkan countries. I was waiting here too. It was, it was for, yeah. for a moment I was yeah. waiting here too. I was waiting on this topic right here. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, for the good sake of your league as a league, make it a player's league. I when the that, NBA yeah. got good marketability and started making more money, it was a player's league. Until Magic and Bird kind of was, ah, uh, and then Mike came. When Mike came and was like, okay, it's Players League, we, we yeah. pushing Mike to, and that's when you start getting more marketable. I mean, as much as fans like coaches and, you know, they're a little bit older, you know, they're not as personable, they're not, they not as bright, as vibrant. Let's take our coach. He won't even wear a, too bright of shoes just because he don't want the attention. That's my point. Make it about the players. People want to see what players got on, what players got going on in their life. 
what's going on day to day. It's, it's, you know, people care more about players. And especially with this format where you can't have practices to prepare, you have the best players is winning you games. Players is winning games right now. Coaches can only make little tweaks from day to day. You only got one day to prepare. So if you don't have the best players to be able to get through games and win games. I think that was the biggest change, uh, what Mike said, that um, honestly, like like you said, five days bef uh, before it was five days between the games, like or even even more, maybe sometimes a week. And so then we were, we were having games that, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, Tesca was playing when, when they won the championship with Messina on, on the team. Mm. They were averaging maybe 60 points per game. So, I mean, and those games are not fun to watch. Let's, let's like be honest. Chess match. It, like it a was chess a chess match. match. That, that year, I think that Tesca Moscow was averaging like 60, 60 points per game and they were like number one team in the EuroLeague for, for wins. So now when there's more games, they try to do that. They're thinking they're going to generate more money from it. So if you try to get, generate more money from it, things changing, you have to change it too. And what Mike said, uh, you know, players are the ones that uh, are watched. We're the ones that are playing basketball, you know. Of course, coaches, they put their influence in it, you know. But again, when it's one, two days between the games, how much of the influence you can have on your team, how much you can prepare. So that now it becomes more us playing from our abilities. So why not to market those abilities and attract more money from the side? Mm -hmm. So practically, how to put players on spotlight? Well, it's a couple ways. Yeah. Fashion. Fashion. Fashion's the easy one. Look at me. Because that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I've, nev I, I've never seen, like, when the NBA players walk in, NBA is always posting what this oh, player Instagram, had on, this Twitter, player, yeah. it's everywhere, it's everywhere. And then the, the NBA players was getting fashion deals overseas, so then they market more of that, so they're going into the fashion world. Now fashion people are watching NBA. All that stuff matters. That's just another market you can get watching your game. Like, it's just ways you can sneak into stuff. We have to learn a lot from the NBA. Yeah. And the other way, that was a, one of the ways, especially off the court and on the court, just encouraging the players' talent more. Just, yeah, you got to do a little bit better with highlights and captions. Man, we got bad highlights and captions. This is Improve stuff, yeah. There's always things to improve, and I think with enough money, with enough will, everything can change, so. All-star game. All-star game, too. All-star game. Money. You want money, you got to put people out there to, you know. Yeah, yeah, to bring your money, yeah. The new CEO, Marshall Glickman, has this idea of, you know, pushing the idea of making the EuroLeague as a player's league. Still early to judge. We'll see what developments he will do. But at least that, that was one of his cornerstone projects in his big picture of the new EuroLeague. So we'll see. Actually, the last Glickman's podcast on the EuroLeague uh, YouTube channel was worth a look because he, you see, you know, hearing his ideas that he has a very different approach that maybe the previous leadership had. So mm -hmm. maybe there's there's a bright spot uh, looking at the future uh, of the EuroLeague. The last topic I wanted to, to ask you, uh, we're midway of the EuroLeague season, 17 rounds has been played and let's make the all EuroLeague uh, team Oh, I'm the bad. I'm past Mike. Without it, without in, you you know, involving teammates, <sighs> that would be unfair. Then I'm not on the team with myself. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot vote I'm not for on yourself. That I'm not on that team, so I can put myself. Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Do I count? Okay, you can put yourself in. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's an easier pick, huh? No, now we locked in. You want me to just do first team? Yeah, just the first team. I gotta think about the rankings. Well, uh, like I said, it's too much. Sasha. Sasha is a power forward or it depends on the... I'm about to figure it out right now. <laughs> players we're having. Madrid is high, right? Yeah, yeah, they're in the mix. One to five. How's the bar? We have it? five teams with 11 wins, so... What's the five teams with 11 wins? Olympiacos, Madrid, yeah. Basconia, Barca, Monaco. Then Fenerbahce with 10 Basconia followers. won't get one. Barca might not either. Who else? Fenerbahce with 10, FS with 9, Jalgiris with 9, Maccabi 9, Restart 9. It's crazy. Yeah, that's <laughs> Like, first and go. 10 seeds, Where's FS? Twins. Seventh. Okay. I'm going to go me, Sasha, 
Sure. Will? See, it's tough. I hate, yeah. I love Will, and that's my guy. <laughs> but this is the problem I feel like with Ephes. Uh. They got so many superstars. How do you just say, okay? But Larkin is not playing. Yeah, but they got two. Yeah, they got two true. bona fide superstars. That's They're true. both top That's five. True. It's it's so hard for me to just say like one of them are not. One of them is, yeah, like one of them is is MVP. Like even when Mises won his, I wasn't, you know, obviously I was in Brooklyn, but it's just like you playing with another person that, you know, mm -hmm. could also have yeah. one MVP. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of hard for me to just say, okay, you're MVP. Cause I mean Because you don't have no help. Like, do you bring your the team by yourself? Like, yeah, you're no, not. You you, it's not. You, you know what I'm saying? If we take, if we took Mises or Will off, would they still be good? Like, would mm -hmm. Ever still be a good team? Like, mm -hmm. would they still be contending for playoffs? Nothing to discount either yeah. of them because they're both obviously amazing. But it's just hard for me to just say, all right, I'm picking Will on first team instead of Mises because this. But it's also hard for me to not say it. Yeah. I know. yeah. So like instead that's of Mises, that's why I'm passing. Like, <laughs> so like instead of Mises, do you fair. do you say do you pull like Lorenzo? Could you pull like Lorenzo up higher because he's Wade's been out a lot. Yeah. They've had a lot of injuries. But let's agree that most of these teams has at least two superstar level players. No, like Fenerbahce, they have yeah. Nick Wilbekin, Motley is playing on an amazing first or second all year league team level. I yeah. would say Madrid. That's that's. A Tough conversation with Madrid because they have Musa, they have Tavares, Deck was having a great season. I think season. Musa, I think deserve, Musa, I think yeah. Musa deserves to make a team. Yeah. I don't know if it's first, but I think he deserves it. Because Musa really, so far. Yeah, yeah, he really improved. It seems like he really improved. And it's his, his first confidence. year. He's doing well. Really well. Motley, I think, deserves some shout yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Motley deserves because when he was out, they were god yeah. awful. Yeah. So we're just missing a one, one perimeter player, I think, right? I don't know, dog. It's tough. It's a lot right now. And then. Barca. Barca doesn't get nobody. Uh, but who would you say from Barca? Besides... Uh, what is that stuff? That's really Miritich. tough. Miritich. Yeah, he, he just came back. Four games. That's what yeah. I'm saying. So yeah. So no one then. Because it's a high, midway, man. I mean, uh, midway. Let's yeah. leave this one spot in this all your league five for our viewers. Yeah. yeah, yeah you can share go. all your opinions in the comments below the video. That was all. That's all, guys. Thanks a lot. That was an entertaining, quality conversation. It's hope great. So. <laughs> it's great to visit Monaco. And if you want us to travel all around the Euroleague destinations, all Euroleague cities, you can support us on basketnews.com/plus. There are three different subscription levels to help us grow and to create more quality content. Thank you all, and follow us on basketnews.com. And what Mike said: All Star Weekend, Conus.